Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Anjana, for the nice introduction. I hope you guys can hear me. Cool. OK, hey, hi, my name is Shikhar. I've come to speak from India, where I work as a software architect at a fintech startup called PhonePay, based out of the city of Bangalore. Today, I'm going to be talking about a clever technique to prevent to token thefts in the browser. Before I begin, I'd like to give a huge shout out to the organization, organizers of this conference, Sabi and uh, Dora and the team, for doing such a great job for putting this together. Please, with me. Thank you. OK, uh, before I uh, proceed to the topic, a quick show of hands if you've ever built applications uh, either front end or back end that require users to log in to perform some protected actions. Ah, perfect. That makes my job really easy now. Uh, OK. Uh, sorry. Something wrong with the clicker. Cool. OK. So if you've ever written code that resembles this, you can almost be certain that under the hood, there's either a cookie or a token stored somewhere in the client browser that lets us derive whether the user has access to the parts of the website that are protected. Behind the scenes, you can almost be certain that there's some variation of OAuth2 authorization flow implemented. OAuth, or Open Authorization, is a framework that helps apps and services secure, securely manage permissions and access to your data. A uh, typical OAuth flow looks something like this. I think I'll get rid of the clicker. Cool. Uh, the user requests for a protected resource. The client realizes that the uh, user might not have access to it, so it prompts the user to log in with their credentials. The user enters their credentials. The client then authenticates the user and then requests for a token from the server, and the, to uh, the server issues a token, and then the client uses that token, or you store that token in the client browser, and then you use it to access the resources that are protected. The token that I'm talking about in this flow, the token that is being passed around, is called a bearer token. A uh, good way to understand it would be to compare it to a currency note. If someone gets hold of your cash, they can do, use it as they please, right? Uh, bearer tokens have been around for a very long time, and they're relatively easy to implement. However, Applications relying on bearer tokens are susceptible to attacks. Hackers use techniques like SSL spoofing, cross-site scripting, and tools like malwares to get to execute attacks like man in the middle or pass the cookie. Pass the cookie? <laughs> really? Uh, I could come up with a better name. Uh, maybe, you know, call it steal your money attack or man in the middle of your happiness. <laughs> uh, anyhow, as harmless as they, uh, they sound, a valid token in the hands of an adversary could lead your users in a lot of trouble. According to a report published by IBM in 2023, the average cost of a data breach was four and a half million dollars. And this is the average. The highest that was reported was around $350 million. Can you imagine that? Another report by IBM highlighted that attacks involving compromised credentials or stolen tokens have increased by over 71% over the last, last three years, making it one of the biggest uh, and the most predominant attack vectors. As front-end engineers, when it comes to uh, solving user experience, uh, we tend to gravitate and focus more on factors like performance, reliability, which obviously have their own place. However, what we overlook is the impact of security incidents on the overall experience. Uh, people lose their data, they face uh, reputation damage sometimes, and suffer financial losses 
And all of this has far-reaching consequences on the experience than everything else combined. So as I mentioned, I work for a fintech startup. Uh, it's not a startup anymore. We, uh, it's one of the biggest fintech organizations in India. We have a user base of over 500 million users, registered users. And one of my key responsibilities as an architect is ensuring that we build applications that are safe and secure. So in the quest for figuring out a solution for the uh, uh, shortcomings of the bearer tokens, I came across an IETF draft called DPOP, or Demonstrating Proof of Possession. Uh, when I came across it, it was still a draft. Thank, uh, over the years, it's now finally in the RFC stage, and uh, it's shortly going to become an open standard. So what is OAuth? It's a framework that describes a mechanism to issue sender-constrained tokens. What are sender-constrained tokens? Let me uh, uh, go back to my currency note analogy. And uh, let's imagine that the bank starts to issue currency notes which have your name and your photos printed on them. The financial system would collapse, right? Uh, but you won't be worried about someone stealing your money, right? Uh, Depop does this for bearer tokens, but obviously without uh, such dire side effects. Let's, let's actually uh, take a look into how it works and dive deep into the exciting part of the talk. OK. Uh, all of this, by the way, happens inside the browser instance. So uh, as you, uh, my assumption is that uh, we'll be using browser APIs. Cool. So the first step is that we generate an asymmetric key pair using a cryptographic uh, algorithm called elliptical curve. It's an asymmetric cryptography, uh, cryptographic uh, algorithm which generates two keys. One is the private key and the public key. The private key is used to sign data or uh, encrypt it or and the public key is used to verify it. You can't use public key to sign. Uh, OK, the first step is that you generate a public-private key pair inside the browser. Uh, the, the syntax for generate key uh, using the Web Crypto API looks something like this. Uh, the generate key function of the uh, API takes in three parameters. The first one is the algorithm. In our case, it's going to be elliptical curve. And uh, the third one is the usages of those keys. So uh, our use case uh, only sticks to sign and verify. And uh, I'd like, to f uh, like you to focus on the second parameter uh, called extractable. It's a Boolean value that tells the browser to keep the private key in the browser itself and never extract it. This is very important, and we'll learn soon why. Cool. So first step, again, uh, is to generate a public-private key pair. Keep it in the browser. Using the key pair, you generate a proof in the form of a JSON web token. Uh, show of hands, uh, people who know what a JWT or a JWT or a J JSON web token is. Perfect. Cool. Uh, so we create a JWT, and uh, a, uh, this JWT contains three things. One is the public key. Which is, which is extracted, by the way. When you extract a public key, when you make a, uh, generate a key with extractable false, it only makes the private key non-extractable. The public key is still extractable because it's public. So we use the JWT contains the public key, the payload, and the signature using the private key. All of this combined is called a DPOP header. The next step is fairly simple. You just include this header in the request to generate the access token. Upon receiving the token, the server unpacks the DPOP header, verifies the signature using the public key included in the JWT. The verification ensures that the client application has the private key, which corresponds to the public key. The server then generates an access token and binds it to the public key that was sent to the server. 
which, is, which was present in the Depop proof JWT, and then issues that access token back to the client. The final step here is uh, very similar to the fourth step. Uh, before making an API call to, the, uh, to access the resource, the client includes the access token in the authorization header that we do today using the bearer tokens. And along with that, it also again generates a DPOP proof. Uh, that includes, the, again, the public key, the payload for the request, and a signature. This gets included in the request, again, as a header called DPOP. Again, the server, when it receives this request, it first validates the proof of possession by unpacking the DPOP jot, verifying the signature, and then it uh, validates the access token. And finally, uh, if everything's right, it responds back with the requested resource. Uh, this is how the final request would look like. The two important pieces that I spoke of, one is the authorization header. Uh, there's a slight modification in the way uh, you send the authorization uh, token. Uh, instead of bearer, it's called DPOP. So you replace bearer with DPOP, and then you append the access token. And the next header is the DPOP proof that you just generated from the client. Now let's review a scenario where someone steals your access token. Just the access token won't cut it because it's bound to a private key. Uh, sorry, it's bound to the public key. The server would expect a DPOP header. It is impossible to generate a DPOP header outside of the client application because the private key never leaves the browser. Uh, the DPOP header cannot be tampered because it is signed by the private key, which is again present in the browser. The proof of possession is unique for each request. Hence, stealing it wouldn't help. Every subsequent request is signed when it leaves the client and then is verified at the server. This ensures that, again, it's not tampered during the transport. So yeah, voila. Uh, this is how you uh, use Depop to keep bad actors at bay. However, it's not always sunshine and rainbows. Uh, Depop is always also susceptible to some attacks. These pesky hackers, they never go away, do they? Uh, thankfully, uh, we know how to kick their pesky hacker asses. Uh, let's, let's take a look at each of these attack vectors and learn how to mitigate them. So the first... Uh, attack is called a replay attack. As we learned, the DPOP proof is unique for every request. But what if I intercept a request? I can get hold of the DPOP for that particular request and the access token, and I can continue to replay that to my benefit, right? So adversaries use this attack to perform actions repeatedly to their benefit. Imagine. Uh, uh, an API that adds balance to your account, or an API that applies uh, coupon coupon codes. Uh, you could uh, infinitely up, uh, add coupons to your transactions. Uh, you obviously would have some sort of uh, prevention mechanism at the application layer, but the net the, the network infra should also be able to handle such requests, such attacks. So one way to fix this is to reduce the validity of the DPOP tokens itself. Uh, uh, to understand this, let's take a look at a sample uh, decoded DPOP. So uh, let's focus on the payload of our DPOP header. There's a, an attribute called IAT. It stands for issued at. It's the timestamp at which uh, the token was generated. Uh, the server can read this timestamp and check whether the token was created within the stipulated duration, and reject any proof that has expired. This helps reducing the scope of attack to a very small duration. Uh, OK, the next one uh, is called a token pre-generation attack. Uh, what you can do is if, if, if an adversary gets hold of your execution environment, uh, uh, like through a browser uh, plugin, they can potentially generate infinite DPOP proofs ahead of time. Uh, for different requests, and then use them later 
at a later point in time. Uh, to mitigate this, uh, the draft has an uh, interesting uh, uh, solution proposed. Uh, the server can issue a time-sensitive nonce while uh, issuing an access token. And uh, this nonce can be included in the DPOP header, uh, as, like the one that we just saw. Uh, the server, upon receiving, can actually validate that nonce and uh, decide whether to reject it or basically check the validity of the nonce. Uh, OK, moving on to the third one. This is the most peculiar, and the ITF draft also uh, doesn't talk about it. Thankfully, mitigating this is also very easy. Uh, browsers, uh, OK, sometimes uh, adversaries uh, can g gain control of the CDN and modify the JS that is being shipped, or the, the JS that, has, that is being requested and make the private key extractable. It's essentially like a, a Boolean value, right? If you can uh, uh, intercept the JavaScript request and just change that Boolean value to true, you can essentially extract a key and then use it to generate DPOP proofs at later point of time. Uh, so browsers have a feature called sub-resource integrity. Uh, or SRI. SRI is a security feature that enables browsers to verify the resources they fetch uh, and make sure that they, delivered, they are delivered without any manipulation. Uh, so what you do is you create a SHA-256 or a 384 hash of your asset, which is Java, your JavaScript bundle, and you append it to an integrity attribute in your script tag. Upon receiving the request, browser looks at your integrity tag if it's present. It also generates a hash, which is mentioned, like which, okay, I don't have the example, but okay. So the way you uh, append the hash is you name the algorithm and then you append the hash. So once, you, uh, once the browser uh, receives the response, it reads what hash it has to generate. It takes it takes your JavaScript bundle, it generates a hash, compares the two hashes. If the two match, then it executes it, otherwise it throws an error. OK, uh, this concludes the mitigation techniques that you can use to ensure your DPOP implementation is valid. Uh, despite its shortcomings, uh, DPOP proves to be a very effective solution to token theft. I hope more people adopt it and make the web a safer place. Uh, that's all for me from me today. Thank you for being such a great audience. Uh, I'll, if you have any questions, doubts around implementation, I'll be hanging around the community lounge. Uh, would be happy to help you with your doubts, queries about the topic, or just chat in general. Thank you.